You can see buildings. Uh, it's all there. And then a few uh, weeks ago, actually it was around my birthday, I got to thinking, geez, I wonder if there's anything else. And I pulled out a book out of my library, and uh, I went to that great library, great book place in Portland a few years ago and cleaned them out of every NASA book they had. And a lot of them were printed way back in the 70s, which is before NASA got real talented with their airbrush. And I got this book called SP-246, and it's photos of um, Apollo 8, 10, and 11. It was published in 1971, and this just happened like in December. I started putting these photos on the scanner and looking at them, and it was just amazing. There is a city. I mean, there's a spaceport, what looks like a spaceport. There's tubes, there's roads, there's vegetation, there's lights. I mean, it's all right there. So I sent this one uh, clip or this one uh, photo of 2209 uh, to Beth and Ron, and they looked at it, and they said, this is absolutely amazing. So from there, I started clipping more photos, and we found more and more stuff, and that's how it all happened. And those photos are the ones that uh, you have on your uh, web website. How, how do we know, John, if these mining operations are ours and not extraterrestrial events? How do we well, know? I'm sure they're part extraterrestrial. We couldn't have possibly put that that massive a mining operation together in 40 years. I mean, we could no. have. I don't think we did. Somebody else is up there. Somebody else built all those buildings. There's no possible way we could have done that. You think we just kind of inherited them? Yeah, I think, well, I think we work with them up there. Now, I don't know who that is up there, but um, um, they're the ones that built all that, and we're doing mining. Now, the reason I know that we're involved is several years ago, I ran into a real honest-to-gosh government insider. He's dead now, but he told me three things, and one was that we had been going to the moon since 1962, uh, that the um, the that the population of Mars was 600 million, and they looked just just like us. And um, the other thing was that he had worked on a piece of mining equipment that was uh, to go to the moon. He said, John, he said, we built this thing down in Alabama, way out in the nowhere. He said, it was so enormous. He said, when we finished the project, he said, I actually rented a little airplane. He said, I'm a private pilot, and flew around this piece of equipment just to get an idea of how big it was. And I said, geez, that's fantastic. How, do you, how did they get it to the moon? Yeah. He said, I don't know. And that's you know, the deal in compartmentalization. You get to know a little bit of the program, but you don't get, get to know the whole thing. So he knew a little bit, but he didn't know the whole thing. What an now, incredible... if you ask where the operations are from now and how they keep them so secret, I think it's Antarctica. And uh, if uh, anybody wants to uh, check uh, Google search words, I recommend two things. One is moon mining. You're going to be absolutely stunned at how much there is, I think there's a million five hundred thousand hits on moon mining and space law and Clementine. Just Google those things and see how much there is. A couple of these pictures you you sent us, specifically uh, the crater Kepler, uh, and then you look at the airbrushed version. Two different. It looks like two different craters. Absolutely. I mean, the structures are all gone. Yeah, like I said, uh, NASA did, uh, didn't get proficient with their airbrush till about 1972, 73, and they went back and, and got all these pictures. But those of us who got the early pictures have the good stuff. And on Kepler, uh, you'll see uh, the Lunar Orbiter 3-162 picture. I mean, there's obviously stuff on that crater. There's there's obviously a um, a strip mine there. There's obviously buildings there. And then you go to the Apollo 12 photo that was taken uh, several years later, and it's absolutely clean. It's there isn't a trace of uh, anything. Well, they came down and took all the equipment away, <laughs> but yeah. you're right. It, it is absolutely incredible. Now, how do you know, though, in some cases, we're not looking at, uh, you know, tricks of light or, or just different images uh, when you look at this? Well, take a look at that yourself. I mean, there's buildings on the uh, the rim. And then there's not buildings uh, there. Uh, some of the pictures are great. As a matter of fact, uh, did you see the one of the um, of Aristarchus? You know, we're always told that Aristarchus is the uh, the brightest spot on the moon. We can see it. And Im any image you can buy or or purchase or moon pictures, it's always just a white blob. 
And so we had a guy uh, take a 10-inch telescope and uh, take a picture for us. And you can see it right in those pictures that we've got on your website. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful structure, and it looks exactly like um, a nuclear reactor to me. It's a probably a fission reactor. There's no doubt about it. You can see the arches. You can see the, the uh, blue glow, and uh, the blue glow comes from when uh, radiation hits molecules mm -hmm. of air. And now you're going to say, wait a minute, there's, there's no air on the moon. Well, as a matter of fact, the moon has a breathable atmosphere, and it has gravity 65% of, of what's on Earth. So, you know, it has, uh, uh, <clears throat> it has all of that. And, and it looks like it's got some arches alongside yeah. of it. Yeah. And then you look at the next picture, I think that um, Lex got it up there. Look at that picture that Clementine yeah. took in 1994. Right Can you imagine that we got a better picture of Aristarchus from a 10-inch telescope than Clementine did with a $100 million satellite? Yeah. Oh, that's great. I love it. It doesn't make any sense at all, does it? It doesn't. So all this has been going on, you think, right under our noses for 40 years, John? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, somebody pulled up some stuff off the Internet uh, that my father was involved uh, in 19, in the early, or in the middle 50s with Annie Grav. And there's a lot of stuff. If you um, Google uh, Bill Lear or William Powell Lear, uh, Annie Grav, he was, he was there doing it. He was right in the middle of it. As a matter of fact, there's a three-minute clip floating around that was originally in David... Uh, had your children's uh, a video mm -hmm. of my dad uh, uh, lecturing on UFOs at the Bonston uh, at the Bonston Laboratories, and he's there at a blackboard. He's got a saucer there, uh, drawn on, it, and he's uh, describing how it works. Uh, the film is silent, but you can see generally what he's doing. Interspaced with the pictures of um, of him uh, are technicians working in laboratories uh, with uh, balsa wood and. Um, and uh, paper UFOs are obviously trying to to make you know what was the beginning of our our efforts. I think that all came to a culmination in 1959. We made the craft. We may have had some help, but anyway, the, our first trip to the moon in Annie Grav was 1962. Now let me tell you this: and you say, "Well, Annie Grav, we don't hear very much about it," uh, and I say that's right. You don't hear one word about it. You don't. You don't see Aviation Week in spe nope. space technology putting. You know, uh, yeah, we're working on Annie Grav, and here's the experiments. Nothing. Not a. Not one single word. And the reason is they already perfected it, and they don't want anybody talking about it. I want to get your reaction, Sean, about this talk about why we never technically went back to the moon. Why did it seem to end publicly, yet we continued going back then? We were already there. That was all a cover. Those guys, you know, the, the Apollo astronauts, the first guys to set on it, and they weren't the first guys. That was all just a cover program so that nobody would know about the real program. Now, why they wanted to keep the real program a secret, I don't know. That, but you can ask, you know, if the, the listeners want to email Michael Griffin, uh, NASA administrator, they're welcome to do so and say, hey, how come this way, you know, John Lear's got some pretty good evidence here that, uh, that we're already on the moon and we're mining up there. What's the deal? You should know you're, you're the administrator. Uh, what are they mining for, John? That is a good question. Uh, what, we, what we think that they're mining for is uh, helium-3. And helium-3 would be uh, an excellent... Um, uh, power source if we can get uh, fusion together. That could power the planet for years. Yes. Yeah. S stay with us, John. We'll be back with you in just a moment on coast to coast -am com. Our special guest tonight, John Lear. And again, if you have a computer, I hope you do by now, get up to the coast to coast -am com website, look at the assortment of photographs he has sent us. Take a look at them. See what you see. We'll be back. And our very special guest tonight, John Lear, as we talk about mining operations, structures on the moon. You know, it was my late aunt, Shafika Caregula, who knew Ingo Swan. And Ingo, through his remote viewing and in his book, Penetration, said that there were indeed structures on the far side of the moon. It's an incredible story. We'll be back with more with John Lear on Coast to Coast AM. Well, Fred, John, you've got a lot of people staying up late tonight. Poor Liz in Ann Arbor, Michigan says, George, I'm a college student. I've got to get to bed. I have to stay up and listen to this whole show. <laughs> it's going all around the country. John, uh, 
let's talk a little bit more about the moon, and I want to get into some other things with you, uh, the Gary McKinnon.